This is the new 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser, and it's a big deal. That's because the Land Cruiser name died a few years ago after decades on the market with an obsessive fan base, but now it's back with a hugely anticipated new off-road SUV. Today, I'm going to review the new Land Cruiser and show you all of its quirks and features. Today's video is brought to you by Cars and Bids, my online enthusiast car auction site that recently sold this and this and this and this and this. All right, time for the quirks and features of the new Toyota Land Cruiser. And I'm going to start with a little history of the legend of Land Cruiser. So this model dates back to the 1950s, and it's always been an iconic off-road capable SUV in Toyota's lineup, known for being able to traverse any terrain and last for decades. Well, here in the United States, over the years, the Land Cruiser got bigger and more expensive until a few years ago it cost $90,000 and nobody bought it. It became unpopular and so Toyota killed it after the 2021 model year. Well, now it's back for 24 and it's in a completely different position in Toyota's SUV lineup. More on that positioning in a second, but first, Let's get to the quirks and features. We start under the hood, where the big news for the new Land Cruiser is that the old model's V8 is gone. The old Land Cruiser used a V8 for almost 15 years. It is no more, and it's been replaced by a four-cylinder. There's not even a V6 available in the new Land Cruiser, let alone a V8. Instead, you get a turbocharged hybrid four-cylinder, although it makes a pretty respectable 325 horsepower and 465 pound-feet of torque. Those are strong figures that should do a reasonable job motivating the Land Cruiser, although no V8 and no V6. Now, the no V6 thing is especially interesting because Lexus sells a luxury version of the new Land Cruiser called the new Lexus GX, which I have already reviewed. And that model, which is largely identical in a lot of ways, does offer a V6 in addition to this four-cylinder. But for the Land Cruiser, it will apparently be four-cylinder only, no V6. If you want that, you got to step up to the Lexus GX. Now, you would think that the benefit of going to a turbocharged hybrid four-cylinder would be gas mileage. And indeed, it it is significantly better than the old Land Cruiser, but this new one, according to Toyota, still only gets about 23 miles per gallon in combined city and highway driving. Definitely an improvement, but not exactly tremendously eco-friendly or fuel efficient. And next up, we move on to the next most interesting thing about the new Land Cruiser, which is the way it looks. This cool, boxy, blocky, off-road, fun, friendly design is definitely head turning and definitely cool and a significant upgrade over the kind of bloated curvy look of the outgoing Land Cruiser model. This is distinctive, awesome, off-roader tough, and it's definitely a totally cool look that's worthy of the revived Land Cruiser nameplate. Now, with all that said, the new Land Cruiser really looks a lot like that Lexus GX I mentioned a second ago. These are similar vehicles, and if you saw them in the right trim and the right color part next to each other, you'd have a hard time telling them apart. So as cool as the Land Cruiser is, well, it's also cool as a Lexus, too. Now, as for the interesting exterior quirks and features, there certainly are some with the Land Cruiser. For one, badging. There's a relatively small Land Cruiser badge in the corner of the tailgate, as you can see. This goes against the convention of most new Toyota models that have the model name written out in giant letters at the bottom of the tailgate. The Tacoma, the Sequoia, and the Tundra are all like this, but for some reason, they skipped it with the Land Cruiser. The other interesting thing back here is the giant tow hitch cover on the rear bumper. I hadn't noticed this in the press photos, but it really is big in person. You notice it. It almost looks like the bumper is wearing a large diaper. <laughs> 
<laughs> there. And it's just kind of funny to see how they did that. Now, also on the subject of badging, up front you have this very cool old school Toyota badge in the grill. Instead of the regular boring Toyota logo, you get a throwback to the old days of Toyota written out, which I find pretty neat. Now, interestingly, that is positioned directly next to these brand new thin LED headlights, which seem very modern by comparison. But Toyota is offering a base model version of the new Land Cruiser. It's sort of a back to basics trim that has circular headlights in front. It's a different headlight than what's on the other trims, which you rarely see two different available headlights. But that's what they've done with the Land Cruiser. And if you want to go retro with circular headlights, you can do that if you get the base version. Now, moving on down to the side of the new Land Cruiser, you can see the rear view mirrors. The door mirrors are quite large and quite vertical. These big vertical squares, which frankly kind of matches up with the overall design ethos and look of the Land Cruiser. And so it works. Now, coming around to the back, an interesting thing back here is that the glass opens up independently of the tailgate. If you want to just open the glass, you can do that by pushing this little button inside this little triangular panel next to the glass. You push that, the glass pops open, and then you can lift it up from there with this little handle next to the wiper. Now, one thing I love about the positioning of the wiper there is that on the inside, you can see exactly where the wiper track goes with this little screw in this circular pattern. You can almost kind of move the rear wiper yourself if for whatever reason you wanted to do that because you are immature and easily amused like me. Now, more on the Land Cruiser tailgate situation in a second. Next up, let's go inside and check out the interior quirks and features. So next we get inside the new Land Cruiser. We start looking around and the first thing you notice is it's very rugged in here. You have all upright dashboard design, the screens, the controls, all upright with squares and blocks and hard angles. There's no sweeping curves or wood trim in here. That's not really how it's done. And it's it's fitting what you'd expect from the Land Cruiser. Although, with that said, I was just in the new Forerunner like an hour ago, and that interior is also very rugged, and in fact, kind of more rugged than the interior of the new Land Cruiser. It looked cooler, it looked more exciting, more interesting, and more adventurous. Which brings me to some confusion about the Land Cruiser and Forerunner and how they coexist. More on that in a little bit, but keep it in your mind, especially if you watched my recent Forerunner video tour as we go through the Land Cruiser. But anyway, next up, moving on to the center console, there's a lot of very useful controls for all the off-road hardware in here. You can see this switch will shift you from four-wheel drive high, which are in all the time, to four four-wheel drive low. Now, in the Forerunner and the Sequoia, some of them come with part-time four-wheel drive. So you're in two-wheel drive until you shift into four-wheel drive. Not the case with Land Cruiser, which is always in four high at all times. There's no two-wheel drive mode or version. Now, go to the left of that switch and you can see the two differential lockers. You have a center locker and a rear locker. And you also have a button here to disconnect the stabilizer bars for extra off-road articulation, which is a nice feature. You don't have to go out and do that yourself you can just push the button and in theory it does it completely for you. Now you move up the center console and you can see there's a dial here to adjust modes. It says mode select and in its default setting it's used to adjust the drive mode that you're in. So sport or eco or normal or whatever. But if you press this center button MTS that stands for Toyota's multi-terrain select system and then the mode dial takes on a whole new purpose. When you're in MTS you can use it to adjust the type of terrain that you're driving on. And when you adjust it, the Land Cruiser will make changes to its driving experience to optimize for mud or sand or whatever it is. Now, you will also see a button below all these that says crawl. This will turn on Toyota's crawl control system, which is a fantastic off-road kind of cruise control, get you unstuck feature. It really is a great system. I've used it many times to get myself out of mini jams. <laughs> And, and I think it's fantastic. Can't speak highly enough of crawl control. Now, as far as the technology and the infotainment screen in the new Land Cruiser, it's excellent. Toyota's infotainment system is great. It's not the most advanced out there. For instance, it can't display like two screens at once, the navigation map and the radio, which a lot of other brands can, but is very responsive, very intuitive, simple to use. Of course, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto come standard with it, and it all just works reasonably well. Now, interestingly, 
the new Land Cruiser does not have the giant new infotainment screen in the Forerunner. I think this is 12.3 inches. The Forerunner has 14.4 inches available. So the Forerunner actually gets a larger screen, which is interesting. <laughs> now, beyond the center screen, also worth pointing out in this interior, directly below it, you have your climate controls, which frankly are fairly standard climate controls. Just physical buttons. They haven't yet migrated into the infotainment screens. So you can turn on your heated seats, change your temperature, your fan speed, where the air comes out, all that usual stuff. Now, directly below the climate controls, you have a wireless charging pad, as you can see here. Unfortunately, just flat with no clip to keep your phone in place, which is a little disappointing. If you're going to be off-roading this brute of a Land Cruiser, your phone will probably slip off that charging pad, and a clip might be nice. But anyway, you also have a couple of USB-C ports here, some for charging, some that plug into the infotainment screen. And back to the screen for one other important item. In the center control stack, you have a button with a camera on it marked View. If you press that when you're in drive, it pulls up a camera system, a 360 top-down camera and another one that is pointed forward. Toyota calls this the multi-terrain monitor because it allows you to see what's coming when you're driving on some rough trail, and it's a nice feature to have and nice and easy to be able to pull up the camera system with just the push of a simple button. Also worth pointing out that within this multi-terrain monitor tool, you can change the color of the example Land Cruiser that's displayed. You go in here, you adjust the color, I'll select blue since that's what this one is, and then you go back to the camera screen and there is our blue Land Cruiser, which is a total weird thing, <laughs> kind of a strange gimmick, but a quirk worth covering. Now, on the subject of tech in this car, the gauge cluster screen situation is worth mentioning and fantastic. It's a full screen and it's fully configurable. You can adjust the left, center, or right panels to show basically whatever you want. The map, the music you're listening to, a trip odometer, your range, your fuel economy, tire pressure, off-road stuff, it's all adjustable in this gauge cluster screen. I've complained in previous Toyota models, including my own Sequoia, which is like three weeks old, that the gauge cluster just doesn't have enough configurability, but the new Land Cruiser and the rest of Toyota's brand newest models have fantastic gauge cluster tech that is fully configurable to exactly what you want to see. And the new Land Cruiser also offers another hidden screen, which is the rear view mirror. Right now you can see it's a standard rear view mirror, but if you flip this switch, it becomes a camera with a screen that displays what's behind you. This is especially cool if you load up your Land Cruiser with people and gear. You can't really see through them to see out the back window, so you flip the switch and you're looking out with no obstruction in your view, thanks to the mirror camera. And next up, this is the part where I gotta do another Forerunner comparison, because I have to say, although this interior is excellent with all of the tech and the features that you want, I am a little surprised by the lack of fanfare in this interior compared to the Forerunner TRD Pro that I was just in. That says Toyota on the dashboard and has grab handles and cool storage pockets and neat carbon fiber trim and rubberized surfaces basically everywhere. The Land Cruiser well, it looks fairly generic, to be honest. In fact, it doesn't even say Land Cruiser anywhere in this entire interior, except on the floor mat, which is obviously just removable. The interior of this just doesn't seem exciting enough compared to that Forerunner TRD Pro, which, by the way, costs about the same or maybe even less than this, which kind of makes you wonder. More on that in a second. And next we move on to the back seat in the new Land Cruiser, which frankly feels actually a little bit more spacious than the back seat in the new 4Runner, despite the fact that the Land Cruiser is actually a little bit smaller. We're talking about inches here, but I do feel like I have a little bit more knee room and headroom compared to the 4Runner. It just feels a little bit bigger back here, maybe due to the overall design, the blocky straight up sides. Not exactly sure what it is, but it is a nice, reasonably roomy back seat. And there's a few nice items back here worth pointing out. For one, you got rear seat climate control back here, so you can adjust the temperature in a third climate zone directed just at rear occupants. And you have your rear seat climate vents in the ceiling, which is a nice feature. They're closer to you than rear climate vents mounted at the back of the front center console. That's kind of cool. You also have charge ports back here, as you can see, two USB ports and a cigarette lighter outlet style port, which is pretty standard stuff, but nice to see you can charge your devices. 
Now, here's the interesting thing about the back seat in the new Land Cruiser. It doesn't offer third row seating. There is no version, no trim of the new Land Cruiser that offers a third row. The Land Cruiser is two row only, which is especially curious because the third row seat is available in the new 4Runner and it's available in the new Lexus GX, which I already mentioned is fairly identical, just a little bit more upscale compared to the Land Cruiser. You can get the third row in those models, but not this although I suspect that's going to change for a couple of reasons. Number one, the rear seat folds down incredibly easy. You got a little latch here, you just pull it, it folds, it folds again, and then it's tumbled forward for easy access to the phantom third row. But when the back seat is folded down, you can also see there's a latch on the back of the second row for third row passengers to fold down the seat so they can climb out. Third row passengers that don't exist, I might add. And when you look into where the third row would be. You'll notice there are cup holders, there are climate vents, there's even USB-C ports back there for people to charge devices, except there are no people because there are no seats. Again, it's hard for me to believe they're going to stick all this stuff in this car and never come out with a third row. I guess we'll see. But for now, the new Land Cruiser is the only model in this world of Land Cruiser 4Runner GX Sequoia that doesn't offer three-row seating, which is another mark in favor of the 4Runner or the Lexus GX if you want to spend a bit more. Kind of interesting. But anyway, let's move on to the cargo area. But before we get into the cargo area, let's talk tailgate in the new Land Cruiser. Now, I already mentioned that the glass opens separately from the tailgate itself, but one drawback that's going to make Land Cruiser faithful disappointed is there's no more split tailgate. In old Land Cruiser models, half of the tailgate went up and half of it came down so that you could sit on it, have a picnic, whatever you wanted to do, that's gone. You have the glass separate opening and then the the rest of the tailgate just opens up like a normal SUV tailgate. Fortunately, it's power operated. Now, you get back here and you can see all the phantom stuff for the third row that doesn't exist. And you can also see a fairly large cargo area. Big, blocky, looks a little bit bigger than what you get in the 4Runner. Again, even though this is a little bit smaller. Again, talking about small amounts here, but owing to this vehicle's boxy design, I think it has a little bit more space, or at least it looks like that. Now, one drawback that I think people are going to complain about with the new Land Cruiser is the load floor height. You can see it's taller than the bumper, taller even than the inside door sill. It goes higher than that to get stuff in here. This has also been a complaint of the new Toyota Sequoia, and the reason it's like that in the Sequoia is for the hybrid components that are apparently under the floor in back. They take up space, which pulls up the load floor. I suspect that's also the situation that's going on here. Now, one nice benefit is there's a little extra storage pocket in the front part of this cargo area if you want to put in gear or other stuff you don't want rolling around. So it's nice to have that little extra storage pocket, but doesn't really help with the load floor problem. Now, it's also worth pointing out, since we're talking cargo area, in addition to all the phantom third row stuff, you have one extra charge port back here, a household style power port where you can plug in household items, which is always nice to have. You go off roading, you want to plug in an air compressor, you can easily do it with this power port here. It's a great feature to see, especially in this location. And also, worth pointing out, even though you've lost the cool split tailgate in the Land Cruiser, you do still have speakers in the inside of the tailgate. And so that way, if you want to do some sort of fun tailgate party, you can't really sit there like you used to be able to, but you can still have music playing and you can plug stuff into that outlet. And so there's a great element of fun nonetheless. And finally, we must discuss the last important Land Cruiser item, which is trim lineup and then positioning within Toyota's lineup, which is, as I've mentioned, maybe a little wonky, but let's start with the trim levels and pricing. So the Land Cruiser is going to launch with three different available versions. The base model, which like I said, is the back to basics stripped down version for people who want the simple life. That's called the 1958 model, which is a nod to when the Land Cruiser came out. And it starts around $58,000 with simple basics like cloth upholstery. Now, if you want some more nice stuff, you can get this Land Cruiser.
Cruiser. This is the mid trim level. It isn't named. It's just called Land Cruiser. And it starts around $63,000 with kind of the basics you would expect in a vehicle like this. If you want one that's loaded up with everything, that's called the First Edition. And it has a starting price of around $76,000. It's full of a lot of the great stuff you'd want as an option on this Land Cruiser. Just get the First Edition and you can get it all. Obviously, I don't expect the First Edition to stick around long in the Land Cruiser lineup, probably only this model year, but I'm sure they'll replace it with something similar in the future. Now, all of these prices are a pretty big discount compared to the outgoing Land Cruiser, which started at like $86,000, $87,000. It is, like I mentioned, a totally different position in Toyota's lineup, although sizing is actually about the same. There's only about an inch difference between the new Land Cruiser and the old Land Cruiser. It's just that that one was the ultimate top of the range, has it all, does it all Toyota model. And that position is now occupied by the Sequoia, which stretches up to around $90,000 in its highest trim levels. It's kind of taken up that old Land Cruiser place and the Land Cruiser has moved here. And that's my big confusion. Where exactly is here? What I mean by this is I don't quite understand exactly how Toyota separates out all of the off-roader SUVs that currently populate its lineup. I say this because I just spent three hours with the new 4Runner, and I put up my video about the new 4Runner last week. I haven't driven it, but I poked around as much as you possibly could, and frankly, I kind of like the 4Runner a little bit better, which is a problem for Toyota because the Land Cruiser is more expensive, and it's supposed to be more desirable. You settle for a 4Runner, you aspire to a Land Cruiser. But for me, it doesn't quite work that way. Allow me to explain. For one, I think the 4Runner looks better. That's especially true of the TRD Pro model. I just think it has more of a muscular, bulky look where this is kind of a little bit cartoonish and maybe a little bit overstyled. I just like the look of the 4Runner better. It doesn't seem like it's trying quite as hard as this. Then there's the fact that the Land Cruiser and 4Runner share an engine, not just a similar engine, the exact same engine with the exact same specs. And given that they're basically the exact same size within an inch and a half of each other, it probably suggests the performance is going to be about the same as well. The 4Runner offers third row seating, whereas the Land Cruiser doesn't. Another point for the 4Runner if you're looking for extra space. And the 4Runner, like I mentioned, is going to be cheaper. I suspect it'll start around $44,000, whereas this starts at $58,000 for the stripped down base model. You can probably get a fully specced 4Runner TRD Pro, the cool off-road version, for the same price as this, the mid-trim Land Cruiser that frankly isn't that in inspiring or cool or exciting, particularly compared to that 4Runner TRD Pro, which is all of those things. To be clear, I think the new Land Cruiser is entirely competent and well put together, decent interior, good tech, good space, good powertrain. It has it all. I'm just not exactly sure what it does better than the 4Runner, except maybe for the brand name, Land Cruiser. It's a little bit cooler, I suppose, and maybe some people will prefer the look. But if you want the look, you can also upgrade to the Lexus GX and get more power and third row seating and still retain the Land Cruiser's look. And I get why people will do that over a 4Runner. You get Lexus luxury, more power, you still get the third row, the cool look, but you don't get any of that with the Land Cruiser. Or step down to the 4Runner and you get basically all the benefits of this, but in a pretty similar package that I think looks better. It seems to me the Land Cruiser is sort of floating in no man's land in Toyota's lineup, and I'm not really sure what the compelling reason is to buy it over some of its Toyota stablemates. But anyway, with all that said, I'm going to shut up about the new 4Runner now, and I'll get behind the wheel of the Land Cruiser, and I'll let you know exactly how it drives. All right, driving the new Land Cruiser. First thing I notice the moment I start going, this powertrain has punch. And I say this as someone who had the old V8 powered Land Cruiser uh, and who has a current turbo V6 Sequoia with 440 horsepower. This powertrain has punch. Despite the fact that it's a four cylinder hybrid, you wouldn't think it can really do much. That is not the situation. It actually moves surprisingly well. I had to turn off of a, of a driveway to get onto like a high speed, you know, two lane country road. 
It does it great, absolutely no problem getting there. The other thing I instantly notice uh, driving this is the ride quality is a lot better than it is in the outgoing Land Cruiser. The old Land Cruiser, I mean, there's still a body on frame, but that came out in 2008, and the last 16 years have given us a lot of up, upgrades and technology improvements in the world of suspension and noise vibration harshness, you know, testing and durability, and this thing just seems so much smoother and more calm, especially sitting here going at speed. One of my big complaints of the old one was it really felt truck-like, uh, and this is also a truck, but doesn't quite have the same exact amount of truck-like feel. You do have a high seating position with a square windshield. So there's, you know, you, you feel like you're sitting up and you're in like a big bulky, you know, king of the road kind of thing, but you don't necessarily feel like you're in such a trucky vehicle. It's definitely more comfortable, definitely a calmer, um, let, more settled ride. I will say in terms of steering and handling, um, it is still a bit ponderous. The steering has a lot of play uh, directly on and when you do make any sort of hard kind of abrupt corner, you do definitely feel some roll in the body. It is after all a tall vehicle and again still a body on frame vehicle and so it's going to have some of these kind of trucky characteristics. Certainly this is not a performance vehicle but I am surprised by just how strong that powertrain is. Although I will say when I floor it in that power train uh, and, and go over any sort of little curvy situation, you're getting, you're definitely getting more body roll than I think, you know, you would expect in, in anything that's really, really settled and really kind of street focused. And that's the trade-off for an off-roader. You know, I'm kind of in a unique position here to judge this vehicle um, because I have a Sequoia, I had the old Land Cruiser, um, I've got a lot of experience, in, and I just drove the new GX. I've got a lot of experience in all these. And I would say this, this slot's right in there. Uh, there's a few things I like about each of them better. The Sequoia, I prefer that wonderful V6. Uh, this is a great powertrain, but it's hard, it's hard to fight against that. And even with the Sequoia's extra size and weight, it still feels more brawny and muscular. Overall, this does feel uh, like a great vehicle. This is in the $65-ish thousand dollar price point, this exact one. Um, we were all hoping they'd bring the Land Cruiser name back. I'm glad that they did. I am, again, not really sure exactly how it fits into the lineup, considering it's sort of in the same place as the 4Runner, just sort of a more expensive 4Runner. But you do get this cool Land Cruiser name, definitely cooler styling, and probably a little bit more capable off the pavement. Uh, we'll see how the new 4Runner does. My only real gripe is I, I, I really wish they had put the third row in the Land Cruiser. Um, and it would be cool to see what this, how this performs if it, if it happened to have the Sequoia's V6. Even a detuned version with only 400 horsepower uh, like the GX has. Overall though, I think they've done a good job bringing Land Cruiser back. It really mimics the old school styling in a very cool way. And I think it's a special vehicle that, that is reasonably priced, looks cool, and drives reasonably well on the pavement. One of the things I think it's worth pointing out about the new Land Cruiser is that the driver assist tech is really excellent. Um, similar stuff to what I have in my Sequoia, and I really like it. Uh, you can't do auto lane changes, which is a little bit of a disappointment, um, but it does do an amazing job of lane tracing. So when you go around kind of highway curves or whatever, it does a fantastic job of keeping the car going with only minimal driver input. You don't have to babysit the steering wheel all that much. You just have to kind of keep a hand resting on it, uh, which is the kind of the mark of a good driver assist tech right now. Now, in terms of the off-road capabilities of the new Land Cruiser, unfortunately, I haven't really been able to test them. We, we came to an off-road facility to do exactly that, but unfortunately it rained and so all all the trails got incredibly muddy and it's not really a usable scenario. I mean, I'm driving it right now on sort of a dirt track um, and I have driven in a little bit of kind of thick oozy mud and it's, it's performed admirably, reasonably well, but not really enough to test it. Still, it does give you a very confident feel when you're off the pavement um, and in that mud, you know, power transfer to the wheels seemed like it was great, etc. But we're talking about a really small amount of time. I, I would have been nice to be able to test it more, but I don't control the weather. And so that's the new 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser. Frankly, this is a fantastic truck with some excellent benefits, and I'm absolutely thrilled they brought back the Land Cruiser name. Frankly, I still miss the big boy, the giant 300 series Land Cruiser that Toyota sells globally, but this is a fantastic revival of the Land Cruiser brand here in the United States. And now it's time to give the new Land Cruiser a Doug score. 
And the Doug score is here, 58 out of 100, which puts the new Land Cruiser here against some rivals. It does only okay, tying the new Sequoia TRD Pro and falling behind the new Lexus GX, which has a bit more power, a slightly nicer look, and more equipment. The real test will come when I actually drive and review the new 4Runner, which looks like a cheaper and more practical Land Cruiser. And since they have the same powertrain, I have a pretty good idea already how the 4Runner will drive. Frankly, I'd probably wait to get a 4Runner over the new Land Cruiser, which is more expensive. But if you really want the Land Cruiser brand name, you can pay a premium for it. 